All right, everybody, welcome back to this ninth and final lesson in our series of lessons on shock. In this lesson, we are going to wrap everything up and talk about the different ways to identify what type of shock your patient is in. My name is Eddie Watson, and I am going to be your presenter for this series of lessons. And as always, in order to stay up to date on our latest lessons, make sure and subscribe to our channel below. Don't forget to hit that bell icon, though, in order to get those notifications when we release new lessons. All right, so we have made it all the way through this series of lessons. We've covered everything from the basics of what shock is and how our body responds to it. We talked about the different stages of shock, as well as we did a deep dive into each one of the different types and causes of shock. And so finally, for this last lesson, I want to bring it all together and put it all in one spot and really give you some tools in order to help you be able to identify or differentiate what type of shock your patient is in. So in order to do that, I have a chart that I put together here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this chart in order to compare the different types of shock as well as some of the signs that you would see and really be able to compare these side by side and see where some of these differences are in order to be able to help you to pinpoint or identify what that underlying cause of shock is. Now for this, I'm only going to cover the four most common forms of shock that, that you're going to encounter. But really, if you review through the past lessons and really get an understanding and an idea of what's going on with each type of shock, you really should be able to identify what's going on or potentially what that type of shock is that's that's causing the shock state for your patient. All right, and so these four types of shock that we are going to cover here, the first one is going to be our hypovolemic. The next one is going to be our cardiogenic. But this is also going to include our obstructive shocks that we talked about as these, for the most part, present themselves in the same way as cardiogenic shock. The next of these types of shock is going to be our neurogenic, which, if you remember, is one of our types of distributive shock. And finally, the last one that I'm going to talk about is septic shock. Again, another form of distributive shock. You'll see that I do not have anaphylactic shock on here. And really, this is not a very common type of shock that you're likely to encounter. And a lot of it really looks a lot like what you'd see in septic shock with a few differences. All right, so when talking about each of these types of shock, we're going to look at what you would expect to see with the patient's heart rate, with their systemic vascular resistance, with their cardiac output, with their CVP or wedge pressure, really an indication of our preload our venous oxygen saturation, and finally, how does their skin look and feel? All right, so the first one that we are going to talk about is hypovolemic shock. And with hypovolemic shock, and so when we look at our patient's heart rate, the body is going to be attempting to compensate in order for that decreased cardiac output and that decreased perfusion by increasing our heart rate. And oftentimes, you'll see a pretty sizable increase in heart rate. Now, when we look at our SVR, again, our body is working to try and compensate for that decreased cardiac output and decreased perfusion. So again, we're going to see our body look to increase our systemic vascular resistance with that squeeze. And ultimately, we're going to see a pretty markedly increase in our SVR. Now, I'm going to skip past one here for just a minute and go on and talk about our preload indicators. And since we know our preload is a result of blood returning back to the heart, in the case of hypovolemic shock, we don't really have much blood or volume to return back. So we're going to see a decrease in our preload indicators. As a result of all of this, you are going to see a decrease in your cardiac output. And while the body may attempt to compensate and make up for this, in profound states of hypovolemic shock, it's just not going to be able to. So now when we look at our venous oxygen saturation, due to the decreased perfusion, it's going to take longer for that blood to work its way back to the heart. And so the cells are going to be using up more of that oxygen that is in the blood. And so we're actually going to see a decrease in our venous oxygen saturation. And finally, when we look at our patient's skin, 
due to the compensation mechanisms and that sympathetic response. We are going to get that vasoconstriction as we saw with the increased SVR. And this is going to lead to our patients having that cold, clammy skin. All right, so moving on to cardiogenic shock. Again, when we look at the heart rate, the body is going to attempt to compensate for our decreased blood pressure. And so we will see an increase in our heart rate. Now, sometimes in the case of some pretty diseased hearts, the heart may not be able to compensate quite as much as we would see in other forms of shock. This will also lead to an attempted compensation with our vasoconstriction and our increase in our SVR as the body attempts to increase that flow of blood back to the heart. But this is where we find an example of a compensation mechanism that actually is going to hurt us in the end. Because in the case of cardiogenic shock, we have a weak heart that is not able to, it's not able to pump that blood forward. And so by increasing that systemic vascular resistance, we're actually making it more difficult for that heart to beat. And so as a result, along with the fact that our heart is just not doing well, we're going to see a drop in cardiac output and sometimes a pretty profound drop in that cardiac output. Now, when we look at our preload indicators, the biggest problem in cardiogenic shock is the heart is not able to beat that blood forward. It's not able to push that blood forward. And so as we talked about, things begin to back up throughout the system. And so you're actually going to see an elevation in your preload indicators, whether that be your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or your central venous pressure or your CVP. And in addition, when we look at our venous oxygen saturation, again, that blood is moving slowly throughout the system. So the cells are going to be extracting more oxygen from the blood that is available. And so we're going to see that decreased SVO2. And once again, as a part of that compensation mechanism and the vasoconstriction, we are again going to see that cold, clammy skin in our patient. All right, so looking at neurogenic shock, when we talk about our heart rate, as we talked about, we no longer have that sympathetic nerviation of the heart while maintaining our parasympathetic activity. And so we are actually going to see a decrease in our heart rate as our body is unable to compensate for any changes in our blood pressure. In addition to that, we've also lost our sympathetic activation and our vascular vasoconstriction. So we are going to see a decrease in our SVR. For our cardiac output, we may see it stay about the same, but also due to other factors going on, we may also see a decreased cardiac output. And again, looking at our preload indicators. And again, with our neurogenic shock, we have massive vasodilation and that blood is pooling and not making its way back to the heart. So we are going to see a decrease in our preload indicators. And again, just like in these last couple forms of shock, the body is going to be extracting more oxygen from the blood that is slowly making its way through the system. So we are going to see a decrease in our SVO2. Now, finally, like we talked about with the patient's skin, we don't have that vasoconstriction going on as a part of that sympathetic response. So your patient's actually going to have warm, dry skin. All right, and so on to our final type of shock with septic shock. When we look at our patient's heart rate, like we talked about, initially the body is going to attempt to compensate for what's going on, and we'll see that elevation in our heart rate. But as the shock goes on, as we continue to do damage to end organs and vessels and continue to increase the swelling around those cells, we may eventually see a decrease in heart rate. Now when we take a look at our SVR, one of the biggest things with septic shock is that profound systemic inflammatory response and releasing of all of those mediators. And so you are going to have a profound drop in your SVR and a profound hypotension as a result. Now for the cardiac output, this is gonna be very much just like we talked about with the heart rate. Initially, we're gonna see the body compensate and increase that cardiac output, but even more so than we would see in the heart rate changes as time goes on and things progress, we will definitely see a decline in cardiac output. As a result of that profound vasodilation, we are just not gonna be able to get that blood back to the heart. And again, as a result of those leaky vessels, we're going to have even less blood returning or less volume returning. And so you oftentimes will have a pretty profound drop in your preload indicators.
And then when we talk about our SVO2 and our body's end tissue's ability to utilize oxygen, initially, early on, we're going to see a drop in our SVO2. And again, we can have that hypermetabolic state that can really profoundly drop it. But once again, as time goes on and we continue to have that swelling around the cells and that oxygen just cannot diffuse across that barrier, we begin to see a rise in our SVO2. And again, this can lead to a pretty profound rise as our body is just not able to, to make use of the oxygen that is available to it. And finally, when looking at our patient's skin, like we talked about, due to the fever and the inflammatory process, your patient is going to have initially a warm or even hot skin that's going to be dry. But as that shock state continues and we continue to, our body continues to try and vasoconstrict and clamp down those blood vessels, you will eventually see cold, clammy skin. All right, and so as you can see, when you take a look at this chart, you can see some very distinct differences in how our body responds to the different types of shock that a patient may find themselves in. As a result, there's often some very telltale signs that can be a good indicator of what type of shock your patient is in and can help to, that can help to guide the various types of treatment that we would do for them. So I really hope this chart helps to uh, explain that and show that to you so that you can really be able to differentiate you know, what type of shock is going on and what you would be seeing in your patients. And with all of that said, this also concludes the, the last lesson in our series of shock. I really truly hope that you found this series and these lessons useful and that you were able to get some good information from this and to have a good understanding of what's going on with these various types of shock and what your patient may be going through. It has absolutely been my pleasure to go through all this information with you guys. And as always, I truly thank you for watching and I really hope that you found this informative. If you liked what you saw and you did find it useful, please hit that like button below as it does help support our channel. And in the comments below, tell us your favorite part of this video or really any video in this series, as well as feel free to ask any questions that you might have. And finally, I'll include a link down at the bottom that will take you to the playlist that will have all these lessons on chalk, as well as feel free to check out another one of our great series of lessons on hemodynamics. And as always, I really thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next series of lessons.